Welcome to Marketplace and Authority. I'll be your host this evening. I'm Dr. Ken. With me, as always, is Pastor Anthony. Hello, I've got hello. two incredible guests today that will rock your world. You're going to have to stay with us. First, the prophetess of Shea and Dr. Bruce is with us. And, of course, we'll weave in, of course, our pastor, prophet, evangelist, Dr. Karen, and our prophet here at the Marketplace is uh, Lashana will be with us earlier. Now, let's begin. I, we would like to, Pastor and I have been talking about uh, speaking about, uh, you know, what is our gifts and what, what does that mean, your gifts? And what is that, uh, how do we find out our gifts? And we'll get into that in a minute, but I want, first I want to talk about what today means. You'll never have the same day as you have the day. So that's why I always, every program, we always encourage you with one day that will never be the same in the history of time. Today's the sixth month. Six means man or flesh. Eleventh day, I thought that was interesting. It means freedom to choose. Choice of the wilderness or do we go into the promised land? And last is 18, the year. I'm telling you, this is an exciting year, saints, because this is the year of acceleration. This is the year that ideas that have been on hold and new opportunities will come to the forefront. Everything you've been believing for might not happen exactly how you think, but God's going to turn around for a new opportunity for you. All this is next on Marketplace and Authority. Stay with us. Welcome to Marketplace and Authority. Giving you hope for your following purposes. Breaking down the word to uncover the promises that God has for your life. Building your faith to claim those promises. Welcome back. We're talking today about gifting and talents. First, I want to throw in a thought, and Pastor, I'll go to you first. Prophecies about the future and the grace the change, Matthew 10, 41. Now, we have to value, and we'll get a reward for it, that who are we receiving the word for? I believe this is a word for all of you today, and unbelief will kill that word. So let's begin. Would you ever wonder why some people are given different amounts of something, whether it be maybe money, influence, talents, or gifts? And why are some given less? I want to propose to you that we might have to do a better job in our stewardship. I want to encourage you that with some reality, practical insight will free you and move you into a place of thriving and abundance. Pastor, let me come to you. We look at our, the parable, and I love this, is the minus in Luke 19, 11 through 13, and then it picks up again at 15 and 19. Now, Jesus went to Jerusalem with the disciples and thought the kingdom of God was coming to immediately the disciples, of course. And of course, Jesus didn't mean it's coming now, but they thought that. So he said, he gave them a parable. He said, the nobleman, of course, which is Jesus, went to a distant country, he went to heaven, and received the kingdom for himself and then returned. They didn't, they thought, they weren't, they were confused. But he called 10 of his slaves, the noblemen, you know the story, I'm just sharing it with the people, and gave 10 minus, one each, and said to them, do business until I come back. Isn't that what the Lord has been telling us since he resurrected? Do business until he comes back. Then we return later, he receiving the kingdom, Jesus, he received his kingdom, that means his second coming. He ordered the slaves to come back with the money and he asked them, what kind of business had they done? Let me stop there and give you one quick thought, and then you help us. There's 10, right? So only three come back. Why? Is it the other seven didn't believe he was coming back? Thought, one. Second thought is, out of the three, two of the three did something with it. The last one was terrified. Isn't that what's going on with the church? Your thought. Yeah, we, sometimes we feel that, I know I've felt this a lot in my life, that, oh, I don't have enough to offer or, like, to give, and it really holds us back from, oh, I, you, you know, you see someone else with so many great gifts, and then you don't have anything, and you're like, well, 
I can't do what they do. I don't have anything. Just like with the talents, there's another story in the Bible that's just like that when the king gives the, uh, the, the, the talents to the people. And it's, uh, but God doesn't look at it this way. You know, there's, in the Old Testament, there's commandments that were written specifically for this. Mm-hmm. It's amazing to me to see how much the Old Testament relates to nowadays. The whole Bible is so relevant today. And the one that says, do not be envious or jealous or measure yourself to others. And that is Old Testament. And that's really apropos to what we're talking about because it's if we judge our abilities t- towards other people, then we, we can tend not to use our own, just like the guy with the minus did, just like the guy who buried his talent in the ground. Well, the other guy got 10. He could do great things. I only got one. I'm just going to bury it. If I had 10, then I would do something. Isn't that what we say a lot? Well, if only I had this, then I would do that. If I only had this, then I would do that other thing. We're always waiting. Maybe if I was married, then I could go out and do ministry. Maybe if I... Whatever it is, we always have a reason. We're always making an excuse in our lives not to do something. But God doesn't do that. God gives different amounts. And it's about, I think Dr. Ken mentioned the word stewardship. It is what we do with what we have that is more important than what, the amount of what we have. And if we could establish that and start really being thankful, number one, be thankful with what we have and say, God, how can I don't have a lot like the woman who offered a few pennies as our offering. And Jesus said, Your, her offering of two pennies is way more than people pri- boastfully giving millions of dollars. Look what I'm giving, millions. Oh, that's only pennies. Oh, that's not how it works in the kingdom. God's kingdom and currency is different. It is the heart we have and offering with what we have and what we do with it. So even if you don't have a lot, say, God, Number one, I'm thankful for what you've given me. I recognize the gifts that you have given me. And number two, how can I steward that better? What can I do with that, what you've given me? Well done. I want to give a shout out to our, somebody in our audience, uh, Prophet David's with us and Pastor Kathy. Hope they'll be joining us soon on the next program. Let us continue. Dr. Bruce. Matthew 25, 15 says, talents and abilities are two different things. Mm -hmm. Talents are spiritual gifts of the masters, and ability is the power, one natural fitness of skill. So the parable teaches several things. In Matthew, it talks about the talent, which is well done, reward, which is still work to do. The person who likes his gifts will be given more, while the person who does loses them what he already has. So if the person uses a gift, he's incredible to do more with it, and a person that doesn't try at all gets punished. So how do we keep it? Let me give you another thought. If we're walking worthy, humbly, meekly, patient, and forbearing, will lead us to submitting to another in fear of the Lord. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. What do you think about the talents versus the menace. Well, before I go into it, let me share a, a scripture with you. Yes. Um, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Okay. Because we need to know what is the, the gifts all about. Now, I'm going to read the first four scriptures in chapter 12. It said, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant Ye know that ye were the Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the spiritual spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit, and there are differences in ministrations but the same Lord. So, and there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh in all. Now, when you put that in mind, you want to really look at your spiritual gift as an individual. If you're walking with How Christ. How do you tell what a gift is? Then why do you tell the gift? The gift comes from the Holy Ghost. You can't know what your gift is if you're not in this Holy Spirit and if you're not communicating with God. Because God gives you the gift. 
you already have the gift enlarged in you, in your core, but it has to be birthed. And it can't be birthed unless you go to God. And you have to communicate. You have people say, I talked to God. I talked to God. He told me this. Really? Did he? Did he? Did you go? How did you go to God, first of all? Did you go into the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost? Did you go and meditate on the Word? Did you go into the Spirit to get a Word from God so that He can show you what your spiritual gift is? Mm, good point. We have to be mindful on how and what we say yeah, thank you, Lord. That's and good. how we address That's a really good who well, God well is Well done. Prophet, let me come to you. You were sharing with us at lunch earlier that you had some words of wisdom. God was showing you something this week. Will you share that with us? What God has really impressed upon me and put in my spirit is that we need the presence of God in our lives. When God created Adam and Eve, God created Adam and Eve and he placed them, he placed Adam in, a, in the Garden of Eden. That place was al already prepared. It was God's presence. And we as a body of believers, we need God's presence upon our lives. That's the only thing that's going to separate us from the world. And the world is hungry, hungry for the things of God but they don't know where to look. But we, as, as a body, we, some people have been saved 5, 10, 20, 30, many years, and we're still walking around carnal-minded. Carnal That's not the will of God. God's will is for us to be in his presence, to have the presence of God upon us, to speak what the oracles of God, what God has said, to not be intimidated by the devil, to not be moved by what we see. We have to walk by faith and not by sight. These are the things that God is calling for his people to do. These are the things that God is calling for us to, to become. And God, God um, has placed his presence for us. And like my husband said, like Pastor Ken said, Pastor Anthony said, we desire the things of God. We desire the move of God in this hour. And that's what God has really placed in my spirit, for us to become kingdom-minded people, not carnal-minded, not going after the things of this world, but going after God. Amen. Good word. Amen. Pastor, I'll go back to you. Paul said, so what prophet is saying, never stop studying. We need to keep the vision alive constantly. To keep the vision alive constantly, refining by more and greater understanding. So second thought would be put into practice not only what we're believing the truth, but using and applying so it becomes written into our very character. Now, Pastor, let me ask you. On a footnote, the manna, I thought it was very, very interesting, is $17. And it was about 100 days pay in those days, roughly four months' salary, approximately one pound of money. Its weight equaled uh, 50 shirks. So I don't know if I'm saying that right. It doesn't matter. Here's my point. Interesting, 10 slaves got one each. Three were questioned, where were the other? We were talking about we didn't believe he'd come back. But if the first one got 10, one, and raised it to 10, and did you notice that it says he got over authority over cities and towns? I thought that was very interesting. The second one got one and had got five back. Now, the third and got five cities. Difference in authority, and I'll get into that in a minute. The slaves were afraid maybe because the master would not come back or keep them, keep their money. So that was four months wages. They could have just took off with it. Isn't that how some people think the master won't come back? Your thought? Yeah, people, you know, when you, I think failure really stops a lot of people That's from, good. That's really good. from doing, you know, what they're supposed to do, you know, and 10 whatever the dollar amount is today, you're holding onto this money and you're like, well, I could just hold it and just survive off of it, just live like bury it and just kind of live meekly off of this money but some are like no let's let's do it here's an opportunity it's like i always think of the example today of like you know we talk a lot about equality and oppression and something if you gave everybody in the world say fifty thousand dollars fifty thousand dollars some people would use that money and they could build a huge business with that money. They could start out, do some good investments, do some work, and take that $50,000, and eventually they could rule 10 cities with that. Some people, you give them $50,000, it'll be gone. 
in a month, in a week, in a day. Who knows? It'll be gone. So it's kind of our attitude, like, why would God continuously give something to people that just blow it and don't appreciate it? And then they say, well, the other person has ten cities. Well, it doesn't matter if you have five dollars and they have billions of dollars. It does not matter the dollar amount is all the same to God. It does not matter if you have five dollars or if you have billions of dollars, if your neighbor has billions of dollars. What it matters is your attitude and your mindset about how you're going to treat that money. You know, like I know people that are super rich and they'll still pick a penny up off the ground. Yes. And I know people that are poor that think they're too good to pick a penny up off the ground. So the dollar amount is irrelevant. It's the mindset about how thank, like we said earlier, number one, are you thankful to what you do have? Do you recognize the value in what you do have, whether it be one penny or one billion dollars? Do you recognize the value in that? Are you thankful for that? And number two, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to complain that it's only a penny and not a billion dollars? Are you going to gripe at the other people for having a billion dollars and you only have a penny and they should share it? Are you, what are you going to do? How are you going to steward that? What are you going to do with that money? That's really well done. Now, the master gave that mine up, each slave to do business. Whose business was it? Kingdom business, to serve him. Now, watch this. The first slave got a revelation to minister the tenfold. He took one to ten. Second one got a fivefold. Now, according to their faith, could this be it? Now, another thought would be, if we pray for 10 people, remember we have one measure of faith and two get healed, do you think the rest believe that there were th words that the enemy would come in and talk them out of it? Maybe, uh, what I meant three got healed and the other seven felt like they couldn't get prayed for, they couldn't receive the ministry. Same thought. Just watch what happens when we answer those who have little or nothing or little or nothing to take in. So in other words, if they got a little bit, they, they don't think anything happens anyway, and they don't do anything with it. Dr. Bruce, let me go to you. The yeah, first said, exactly. Master, your manna made 10 more. He said, your. That means his gift he gave to him. Mm -hmm. So he said, well done, good slave, because you've been faithful. Now, a slave mentality is he wants to only do as the master tells him to do. He doesn't know anything else. So in that very little thing, he was ruler over 10 cities. Your thought? Well, you know, you made a good point, and Pastor Anthony made, made a point about something that was very important. Um, let's go spiritual, because we have to see the spiritual side. Mm -hmm. Matthew 6 and 33 tells us, seek ye first right. the kingdom of God. Yeah. It don't say him say the kingdom because he's put us here with the spiritual gifts to be kingdom builders so if you really want to know how to build a kingdom you have to read your bible tells you to read in timothy it tells you to read study yourself to be approved to him and man because it ain't about oppressing man it's about letting god see that you know him from the heart and the mind because there's a mindset that comes with it. So read scripture real quick just to touch on that. I'm going to go to Romans 12 and read verses 6 through 8. Having then given difference, have given gifts, different according to the grace that is given to us, where the prophecy let us prophecy according to the proportion of faith or ministry, let us wait on our ministry or he that teaches on our teaching, or he that exhorts on our exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. I'm going to stop there because we have to understand that what God has for us is for us only. Each one of us have a different gift, a different yes. mindset. And according to your faith, the measure of your faith is where your gift takes place where you're allowed to be able to do what God has ordained you to do. And he's giving you the authority to go to communicate with him. That's a good point. So this is where we have to be mindful at. What is all about? What is your gift about? Where is your limit? 
with your gift. If God didn't give it to you, it ain't a gift. Mm. It's a curse. Good point. Mm. So what you're saying is the parable, the talents in Matthew 25, 14, and 30, prophet, let me come to you. He gave, notice how he gave different amounts, five, two, and one, according to their ability. Interesting. Note the parable in the minas, everybody got the same amount, one. So the people had the talents were giving sometimes 12 a month, uh, as much. So what you're saying is the parable the talents in the Greek was the equivalent to, and I'll get, come right to you, 6,000 days of wages. That's right. The talent was a weight, 6,000 days of wages. It represents a financial resource, a gift, a privilege, an opportunity. Jesus entrusts us with his, to his disciples. Now watch this. The Bible says the stewards risk the money to invest. Don't you think in the world today there's always something at risk? Your thought, problem. I believe that, and I believe that what the Bible says, that we were not against flesh and blood. We were not against spirits. And so there's always going to be a risk. Mm -hmm. And if people aren't aware that we have a spiritual battle, then the risk is you don't know what can happen. We don't know what can happen. We have to be in tune to the Holy Ghost. And once we're in tune to God, God himself talks to people. Mm -hmm. He talked to Moses all through the Bible. God spoke to people. He, speak to, he speaks to people today. It may not be the way we think he's going to speak. He speaks through his word. He speaks through other people. He speaks through nature. However, God wants to speak to a person and whatever he wants to get across. We have to be sensitive enough in our spirit and be able to receive what the spirit of the Lord is saying in this hour. Because we can go on and on and on, talk on and on and on, go to many church services, hear many sermons. But if we're not listening to the voice of God, what good, what good is, 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 is his voice? What good are we to him? What good are we to him? Hallelujah. We must be obedient to God. Listen to his voice and become obedient to the spirit of the living God. It doesn't matter what a person may say. It doesn't matter what a person may do. But it matters what we do with God. Amen. We must be obedient. We must be obedient. I speak right now, I speak I speak to the spirit of disobedient from the hierarchy, from the president on down, in the churches, in the pulpit, those people are hiding behind the pulpit, hiding behind their robes, in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. God is calling you out, in the name and the blood of Jesus. God is calling you forth, to be honest, to be honest, amen? So the risk that we ta we're taking is not to hear the spirit of the Lord. God is speaking it's if we are listening and if we are willing to be obedient to the spirit of the living God. Amen. Good word. Amen. So at least we started out with the reward of their stewardships. In other words, they were giving power over stuff, the Bible says, of many things. In the parable of the minas, they were rewarded over stewardships over cities. I thought that was very interesting. And so this, some of the stewardship reap power over things while others reap power over cities. There is a huge difference in influence. The slaves of talents rewarded with a lot more money, but ended up with a lot less authority than the parable of the minas. Pastor, I'm coming to you. And the talents, they said the master made them more, or made you more master, I made you more master than I'll put you over things. And with the minas, they said, your mina has made you more minas. You're giving influence over cities. Your thoughts on the two? Um, that's an interesting comparison to do that. It's um, when you're putting the talents, let's, let's say, say with that, like, I'm trying to figure out how to word this, but the, like we were saying earlier, when you're given something, an amount, and... You know, the one was given to right, 10, right? And the other five, and then the last one, one? Is yes. Is that how it was? Mm -hmm. And uh, the 10 made huge profits off that. A big investment comes, you know, big rewards. Yes. And the medium investment made medium awards. They must have been talented to get that kind of money. They must have been talented. And the, the lowest investment, he didn't do anything with it. And I think that's really interesting because if the same 
you know, probability was going, the little one would have still come up on a little bit, little investment. He would have still made something. That's good. And we don't see that sometimes. We think like, like I was saying earlier, we look at those others who might seem way more gifted and have more talents than us That's and it. oh if only I had that then I could do that and I re that breaks God's heart yes. because we're could, number one we're judging ourselves to others and comparing ourselves to others and in the cosmic scheme of things that has absolutely nothing to do you know with how uh, how close it is to God's heart mm -hmm. you know and if, if that person who had won would have done something to it. Next time he would have gone to the king, the king would have given him five or ten. He would like, hey, that one work. you turned it around and made, made a profit. And that's how God does it with us. If the guy, think about this. Here's, this is interesting. If the guy that gave did nothing with the one, what do you think he would have done with the ten? Mm. If he was given ten, wow. what would he have done? He would have blown it. He wouldn't have done anything smart with it because the the guy that got 10, if he was given one, he would have still made a profit with the one. So if you're not doing something for the Lord with what you have now, then you are not going to do something for the Lord if you have a lot. Mm -hmm. And here's the big thing that I've learned in my life. We always, I hear so many people say, oh, God's calling me to steward millions of dollars and God's calling me to preach before millions and millions of people. If God took you and put you, like picked you out of your life and put you right in that stage with millions and millions of people and with responsibility that goes with it and the influence, it would be a big downfall in your life because when you do little steps at a time, which is the way of the kingdom. You hear all these child actors that get promoted and before they're 15, they're on top of the world and then all of a sudden they just fall apart and blow it. It's because they did not advance the way of the kingdom. God will never, ever give you what you've been praying for and asking for if it's going to destroy your soul. It's not word. worth it, and God would never do that to you, you know? So you have to, have to, have to steward what you have been given. And if you're not doing something with the one, that, with the whatever you have now, you were, God you, was not going to trust you with more because it could be worse for you than it would be before. So well put. Do well, that. Well Please put. steward what you have and be thankful for what God has given you. Well done. And by the way, I wanted to add that one talent is $2.5 in today's money. Wow. Now, case of study of Paul, and I want to bring our prophet in, starts with 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5. My speech, my preaching is not enticing oh, thank words you, of Lord. man's wisdom, but demonstration of the spirit of power, that your faith shall not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Prophet, take it away. What do you think? Um, actually, well, all the glory and all the honor yeah. belong to God, so I just want to say that. But I'd like to touch on what Pastor Anthony said when he talked about the various talents. Okay, so the word of God, yeah, the, the men of God in the Bible, they got the, the 10 talents, the five talents, and the one. Um, but what's interesting is that the word of God says that the first will be last and the last first. So we really don't know, even in that situation, if we're looking at it from an intellectual standpoint, then it would make sense to me why you would believe, well, even the one, even the man who got the one talent, he would have gotten benefited just a little bit, maybe just a little bit more profit from that one. But in the kingdom of God, God could have actually flipped it. And had he been obedient and did with his talent what God, what he should have done, he could have actually ended up better than the man who profited with the 10 talents. We just don't know. That's what the Holy Spirit was in parting upon me right now. But in addition to that, um, Pastor Bruce said earlier that the gift is in the core. And when he spoke that, God showed me an apple. We know that the gifts are the gifts that God has given us. It's not for ourselves. So we have to be extremely mindful. Imagine you're the apple, right? But within you are more gifts. And when we go out into the world and when we do what God has called us to do by imparting our, our gifts, whether it be prophesying, whether it, 
whether it's prophecy, whether it's um, teaching, preaching, whatever it is that God has blessed you with, whatever cooking, whatever the talent is, it's to help the people in the kingdom of God. We all as a body have a part in that body. So say we're here, the cup, I might be the handle. He might be the whatever other parts of a cup are. That was a bad example. I'm sorry. <laughs> but bottom line is that we are individually equipped with something once we're together is dynamic for the kingdom of God. So never forget that the gift and the talent that God has given you, it's not just for you. So to sit and think, oh, if I have more, then I'll do more is extremely selfish because the little that God has equipped you with is actually a tremendous amount to somebody out there that's waiting on you to give them exactly what you have. In Jesus name. Okay. Pastor, I'm coming to you. By the way, the cup means normally is a trial. Take the cup from me, the trial, for the record. Mm -hmm. Person walking with money, the other person, uh, the person, give me a second. A person walk, uh, work for the money and the other person's money work for them. That's the difference between the two parables. Right. If we're wise enough to understand money works for you, you can be given authority over cities because, Pastor, I'm coming to you, because you can create wealth. Wealth isn't riches. Wealth is an ecosystem that keeps supply, keeps going around. Remember, wealth is bigger than riches. It's something you can experience in every area of your life as you partner with God. Your thought. You know, let's talk about the real meaning here of these parables. And God has given us all gifts. And God, God is a creative God. God is continually creating and God is creating beautiful things constantly. And he gives us gifts and talents. And the reason he made us with free will and, and to have these gifts is so we can expand the kingdom of God. We can bring it here on earth. Just That's like good. Jesus said, your kingdom come here on earth it is, it is in heaven. And he uses us to do that. So these stories about these people turning that talent around and getting a lot more is what do we do with what we have? Do we make things more beautiful or do we just spend it and run it dry and enjoy our own life? Mm -hmm. You know, God is trying to build, restore this earth back to perfection and back to the kingdom of God. All of nature and all of creation just goes in that direction towards perfection and beauty. But humans, because we act selfish, we mess up the whole thing. And when we take, think of everyone on this earth, just collectively, just a little bit of taking here and there, a little bit of greed here and there. And pretty soon we're in this dark world that is far from God. And that is not what we're supposed to do as Christians. We are supposed to take the things that we do come across, the gifts we are given, and multiply that, not in wealth, not in worldly terms of investment and capital and gains and money, but in kingdom fruit. And to take what is given, to take a little bit of love, and to spread that out, take a little bit of light, and not to use it for our own self and our own pleasure and gratification, but to multiply that out. That is what God says when He'll be we'll have kingdoms and cities, because that is if our heart is on the financial side and our gain and our stuff, the earthly things. Then, if our treasure is on this earth, then that's where our heart will be, and we'll, we'll be stuck here. But if we look at the eternal things, the fruits of reconciliation and, and, and redemption and giving people a home that have never felt a home in their life. That is what the kingdom of God is. And if we can do those things, if we can multiply that God, our treasure is in heaven because it's not things of this earth. And that is what God is calling us to, to restore the kingdom, to use our gifts, no matter if it's we're super talented and have all this admirable traits or if we have, feel like we have nothing get out there and minister and let God's love flow through you and see what kind of Good magic, work. see what the kingdom can be built through e you. Excellent. That's really well done. Let me close with this. Well done, Pastor. I want to talk about leadership real quick. Leadership does not appear in the Bible, not once. Can anybody hear me? Not one time. Leaders appears three times. 
interesting. Leadership is non-leaders three times. There's a good reason for this. The focus is on God's way to live and the way he does it by following him and his ways. Hear me. Because of these terms, follow, followers, following in the Bible is 258 times. Interesting. We're frequently urged to follow Christ the way of God. There's an examples of righteousness. We are also urged to imitate the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 1.11. I want to bring in one person about leadership that's an authority, of course, our pastor, our prophet, our evangelist, Dr. Karen Smith. Take it away, dear. Thank you, Dr. Ken. I want to ask you one question. Can a leader become a servant or is a leader a servant? I looked up the word servant, and in the Greek, the word for servant is diakonos, which means a table waiter. Not many people want to serve uh, because they think of the job as being menial. But if you look at Mark 10, when James and John, they're talking about sitting in places of honor. They were asking Jesus if they could sit to the left or the right of him. And then in verse 43, Jesus tells them that if you want to serve or that if you want to lead, then you have to serve. And so then we go on to uh, Jesus being a, a very good example. In John, the 13th chapter, he washes the disciples' feet. And that is a true act of servanthood. And then, just to close, though, we should think about this. If we assist people in achieving their goals, aren't we actually leading them? Okay, Dr. Ken? Well done. Yeah. What the most important thing about leadership is leaders are really, like Dr. Karen said, followers. What's most important about leadership is that leaders are really followers. They follow either the same person that set the pattern they brought for success someday of doing maybe business achievements of success or whether it be athletics or scholarships or a, a way of life that brings a growth and a, a real perhaps a good glory to God if we do it in God's name. That's God's concern. Christianity is a way that God greatly desires us to follow. Let me give you a couple and I'll close with this. In Acts 16, 17, it's called the way of salvation. Acts 18, 20, the way of the Lord is, um, is the way of the Lord. Acts 19, 9 is simply the way. Jesus was the greatest leader that ever lived, yet he declares in John 7, 16, my doctrine is not mine. Did you get that? My doctrine is not mine, but who sent me? I thought that was fascinating. Here's the point. The Apostle Paul says, Expo uh, exposes a humbling yet accurate truth about those who are called in his church. We must come to grips because we humble our recognition and acceptance of the reality that's not necessary, it is necessary for his purposes. 1 Corinthians 1, 26, 33, 1. This is so powerful. If you're taking notes, please do this. And I'm closing as fast as I can. In his way, for you are calling brethren that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things. Did you get that? Not many are called by the flesh or mighty or noble. So God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things that the world has put to shame. These things are mighty. The, the base things of the world, the things which are despised, God has chosen these things which are to bring nothing, the things that are not flesh should glory in his presence. But because of him, we are in Jesus Christ that became us wisdom from God. So, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that is written that he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. In other words, all that to say is it's all about him. He, that's why he's chosen us. You don't have to be the most powerful like Pastor said. You don't have to be the most anointed like Dr. Karen said. You have to be chosen because we are a humble we are not wise in the world. Maybe we're less educated. It doesn't matter, but he chose us. God is following the same pattern as he's calling Christians into the church. We're deserving a foolish, weak, base, and divine. It sounds like a great deal like 
lowly Israel. But I want to say this in that point. Um, the only major difference between Israel, the nation, as the entire nation at once, but he calls Christians in the church one at a time. So many times we want to evangelize, especially with the anointed people we have on our show that want to talk to millions about getting saved. It really starts with one. So incidentally, he calls us, we too are slaves, people unwilling slaves. In most cases, we live under Satan's thumb and take orders from him. Isn't that how it all started? Mm. So uh, as in Isaiah 59, 1 and 8, Isaiah portrays the entire culture in collapse, just like the U.S. Isn't that what's happening here? Are approaching the same condition. But notice the reverse English Bible renders this one through three. I thought this was really good. The Lord's arms is not short to save, nor ear too dull to hear us. Rather, it is iniquities that raises a barrier between you and him. In other words, let me finish and I'll say what it means. It's your sins that veil his face, so he does not hear your hand strained with blood, your fingers with crime, your lips speak with lies, or your tongues utter injustice. Of course, the people were praying and fasting for the situation. God did not react and provide the answers because it seems like he didn't do anything. Why? Because verse 2 and 3 gives us the answer. Surprise, surprise, the very people praying for all this, fasting in this crisis in communities, are guilty of committing the same sins that were responsible for intensifying our crisis. Isn't that what's going on in our government? People are supposedly praying, they're interceding and all that. But what are they really doing? We're repenting of our own sins. So God is waiting for a sincere change. Let the people who are crying out to God, in other words, if we'll cry out, if we'll believe, we'll fast. If we turn away, that's what repenting is. Turn away from what's going on with the sin. We will begin to obey his word and restore justice of all things that is going and doing. So in closing, are you checking yourself to be a leader? Is there a hidden sin in your life? I want you to think about that for a second as I close in this last thought. Now, we know there's a terrible problem here in the United States. We know we're not doing very well here in the U.S. We know things are going bad, but have we checked ourselves first? It starts with us. How can we look at our neighbor? As the word says, we look at the speck in his eye and we have a plank in ours. So wouldn't we want to turn it around and say, Lord, what would you have me do? What am I doing? Where is my shortcoming? How can I come back to your Good, uh, into your right standings. How can I be righteous with you? Because yeah. if we walk like him, talk like him, that's what he wants us to do, is be just like him. Maybe next week I'll talk about the mind of Christ. But I know this, it, it's deeper than you ever imagined what the mind of Christ did, how he thought about him the whole time, and that's how things start to happen. So until next week, I challenge you, check, what are you really doing to pray for our nation or the world? Are you checking yourself first, and then praying for others so he can actually hear you? Think about that. I'm Dr. Ken, Pastor Anthony, Dr. Karen, Dr. Bruce, the prophet. We'll see you next week on Marketplace and Authority.